politics and international affairs, uh, developed some isms, a liberal inter interventionism amongst them, um, uh, but somebody who's continued his work post-government on some of the big challenges of globalization in particular. And, and you may not be calling your speech in defense of globalization, or that was what we have up here. Uh, I can, really cannot think uh, of anyone better place to take a look back and forward uh, at the challenges of this remarkable period. Because I would think the, the globalization heyday, in a way, was when you were prime minister, 97 to 2007, is when things really took off. Uh, hundreds of millions of people brought out of poverty uh, and integration of the global economy. Um, we're now living, obviously, in a very different environment, uh, Mr. Blair. We really look forward to your remarks. This is obviously on the record. I want to welcome all of our members and guests. Uh, this is being live streamed as well. We'll have a good opportunity for uh, question uh, and answer after this. But for the moment, uh, thank you very much for joining us and for giving us the John C. Whitehead Lecture 2018. Mr. Tony Blair. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Robin. It's a great pleasure to be here with you at, at, at Chatham House. I was asking um, Robin actually about the origin of the phrase Chatham House rules, and he was explaining to me that it, it was developed to allow people to speak completely frankly uh, and non-attributory. Um, nowadays, we've just got Boris, really, and that's... Um, but... It's, it's a wonderful institution, uh, and I'm very proud to be giving this lecture. I actually met uh, John C. Whitehead a couple of times. He, he was an extraordinary man, um, a great man, actually, a brilliant entrepreneur, a true public servant, and a dedicated advocate for Western values and the Transatlantic Alliance. He also kept going strong until his death at the age of 92, which, as I get older, I kind of like those examples. Um, <laughs> So it's a great honor to give this lecture in his name. <coughs> Globalization and its advocates are on the back foot. Populism of left and right meet at a certain point in denunciation of free trade arrangements, migration, and international alliances. All are portrayed as contrary to putting individual national interest first. The populist wave that's upending Western politics shows no sign of abating. Italy proves that. It's difficult to predict whether we're at the crest of the wave, which will soon subside, or whether it is still building its momentum. I fear it is the latter. Much will depend on the state of the global economy, and here reasonable people differ. Some think it is growing strongly and interest rates should rise in acknowledgement. Others think fundamental weaknesses remain and the world could tip back into recession. Immigration is the most obvious political game changer, certainly in Europe. Stagnant incomes for a significant part of the population reinforce a sense of political alienation. Technology has suddenly become perceived as a threat as much as a benefit. We live in a world of accelerating change where people feel their lives are being changed by forces and interests beyond their control. The politics of pessimism are the fashion. Once it's clear the populism isn't working because ultimately it offers only expressions of anger and not effective answers, the populists may double down, alleging that failure is the result of half-heartedness and that only more of the same will work. Who knows where the dynamic of that scenario takes us? Then the comparisons with the 1930s no longer seem quite so far-fetched. So this is a moment in time when we must remake the case for reason-based politics with a correct analysis of why the world's changing and how we can navigate our way through that change to the advancement of our people and the reignition of the politics of optimism. Things we take for granted must be re-argued from first principles. Why protectionism is bad, why properly managed migration is good, why the technological revolution can bring enormous gains and its displacement impact surmounted. Why the transatlantic alliance is as relevant today as ever. And why globalization is a force driven prim primarily not by governments, but by people. And resisting it is dangerous. But this must be accompanied 
by a stark commitment to deal effectively with the grievances driving the discontent. There is an absurd parody on both far left and right that globalization is a project of the political elite. Dictionary definitions of globalization are strangely unsatisfactory. But in a colloquial sense, we can say it stands for the coming down of barriers of nation, race, trade, and culture, a world coming together, mixing more, integrating more in experience and lifestyle. The forces that drive this process are cheap travel, interconnectedness through technology, which allows us to see how others are living and thinking, which in turn makes migration more attractive, and the desire on the part of people for quality but inexpensive consumer goods. Government can in varying degrees enable or hinder this process, but the idea that government created it or can stop it is fantasy. Moreover, there is no doubt what decades of opening up have done for the world. The world has become more prosperous. You don't have to agree with all the commentary in the books by Rosling and Pinker to accept that the facts are clear. Another parody is that those who believe governments should enable and not hinder this process of globalization somehow also believe that globalization should not only be unhindered, but unmanaged. This is to confuse globalization with laissez-faire. It is a charge often repeated about my government. The unprecedented investment we made in public services in the poorest communities, all whilst keeping borrowing levels below that of the previous Conservative government, the minimum wage and a host of other labor rights, major reforms in tax and benefits, and the development of the university sector is critical to future industrial policy, bear ample testament to how fatuous this charge is. And of course, if in government today and post the financial crisis, I would be doing much more and doing it differently in areas like infrastructure, education, skills, welfare, and preparation for our future, particularly in respect of the coming technological revolution. The interdependence of the world is not a policy, it's a reality. But it has consequences which need to be managed, not by market forces, but by a reformed government structure, which is strategic and empowering. Even regarding the financial crisis, I would urge caution in learning the right lessons, not the wrong ones. This was a failure of understanding about the modern global economy and its new financial instruments, combined with an irresponsibility on the part of some of the players in it. So we learn and adjust the regulatory framework accordingly. But it neither invalidates the overall importance of markets, nor free-flowing global finance as a necessary part of them. Likewise, there is little doubt that protectionism harms prosperity. That is the one unequivocal lesson, actually, of the 1930s. The tariff measures today of the USA aimed at China have an origin which is understandable. It's true, China needs to open its markets and abide by the rules on technology transfer. There may well be reforms of NAFTA and issues to do with USA-Europe trade which are legitimate. However, the manner in which these concerns are pursued affect crucially the climate for international trade. Pursued as part of a dialogue about how the international trading system can be reformed, they can lead to trade which is fairer and still free. Pursued unilaterally as a straightforward assertion of national interest, they can trigger a chain reaction which can do profound harm to the international order of trade. This is where the transatlantic alliance has never been more needed. The unipolar world of the late 20th century is giving way to a multipolar one. The emergence of China is the new geopolitical fact. ...the size of the UK's, but Russia has shown remarkable resilience in reinventing its military and security capability. All around the world, there is a new model of government competing with our notion of Western democracy. This strongman, 
model of government claims to be more effective, more productive, less decadent, less paralyzed than ours. And it has its admirers and imitators in the West. It treats democracy not as a cause, but as a game where the smart people flout the rules rather than play by them. America is described traditionally as the leader of the free world, Europe its partner. This transatlantic alliance is different from any other because it is explicitly an alliance of values as well as in our own self-interest. It has created the societies we now live in, which for all their faults are still those most people around the world aspire to. I will say it's a great test of any country, of people trying to get into it or out of it. We know the answer in our own case. Rule of law, free speech, an independent media, the right to elect those who govern you, basic elements of social solidarity and decency, and a rules-based international order. We don't always fulfill these goals, but we have always accepted we should try to. Yet these are contested positions in the multipolar world of today. The transatlantic alliance is the bedrock of our value system and way of life. Yet the right-wing relegation of it, a secondary to national interest rather than part of it, and the knee-jerk left-wing reaction against anything American-led, is leaving this alliance in danger of fracture. This will damage both of us. Of course, there could be disputes as over trade, commitment to NATO spending, how to tackle the Middle East, or climate change. Friends could disagree. But we need to know from the current American administration and its president, that our alliance matters, that it is regarded historically and for today as a vital American strategic interest. And leading European governments, if they're given that visible and clear reassurance, need to respond in kind. We need leaders both sides of the water explaining the importance and seeking ways of strengthening this alliance. Inevitably, we then come to Brexit. <laughs> if it is by consensus the most important decision we've taken as a country since World War II, then our preoccupation with it The debate on Brexit has naturally focused on the economic fallout, but the political effect of Britain leaving the European Union may be worse. At a stroke, Britain loses its position in the world's largest commercial market and biggest political union. America loses its foremost ally in the European Union, which has often been a bridge between the two sides of the alliance. And of course, the Brexiteers will argue that Britain can still be the USA's greatest ally outside the EU. But examine the reality. Since the referendum, does Britain feel closer to the USA? Is the relationship stronger? On a global issue, who is the American president calling first on the continent of Europe? The British Prime Minister? As for the USA, the reason why any American president should be strongly supporting the European Union is absolutely topical, the here and now, not old-fashioned sentiment. In a world where population and GDP and therefore global power become realigned, where by the middle of the 21st century, India's economy, never mind China's, will be several times the size of Germany's, America needs Europe united and standing with it, not isolated as individual nations, able to be picked off one by one by the new emergent powers. The only people who gain from a fracturing of the transatlantic alliance are America's rivals or adversaries. I do not believe this is the desire of the present administration, but too many Europeans do. This feeling needs to be countered with vigor and urgency. Some in America think Brexit will boost the American alliance. This exposes the contradiction at the core of the Brexit coalition, which is the reason for the mess we find ourselves in, and it's important our allies understand it. The intellectual driving force behind Brexit is a mix of nationalism 
and ultra-liberalism. These are people on the right of politics who think Thatcherism is incomplete. They want out of Europe because they think it bureaucratic and overly regulated. They want a Brexit where we sell ourselves to the world as not Europe, changing our economy so that it becomes attractive for investment despite our exit from our main market with economic restructuring, deregulation, lower tax and therefore lower spending, and probably deep reform of public services, including the NHS. Geopolitically, they want an even tighter alliance with the USA. However, the foot soldiers of Brexit, those in labor areas in the north of England, critical to the Brexit vote, they do not share the liberal part of this vision. On the contrary, they were persuaded by promises of a crackdown on immigration and more money for the NHS. Neither are they big supporters of even closer ties to America. And I point out the official opposition is opposed even to the American president visiting Britain. The risk for Britain is that we leave Europe with a deep, unresolved disagreement about what our future political or economic should be. On the one hand, clean break Brexit is a 10 to 15 years project. Short and medium term, the pain will be significant. Presently, we have two service sectors, financial services and technology, where Britain is predominant in Europe. Exclusion from the single market will hit both. In time, maybe we can rebuild by making ourselves super attractive. But it's going to take years. The statements on the industrial side from the car, pharma and aerospace industries similarly are not threats. They're warnings. The essential disingenuousness of the Brexiteers is to pretend leaving is an act of will. The comparison Boris Johnson gave of the Brexit negotiation to that of President Trump with Kim Jong-un betrays a truly shocking misunderstanding of the relative bargaining power of the EU to Britain with the greatest world power in North Korea. What we have learned since the 23rd of June 2016, if we learned anything, is that after 45 years of intimate trading links with Europe, the disentanglement is complex, intricate, and replete with hard choices. The trouble is the compromise position favored by the cabinet, so-called moderates, and Labour, is also unsatisfactory. Supposing we stay in a customs union, or in a single market, or in some version of them. Suppose this is apparently is one proposal, we end up in the single market for goods. Then we will have to abide by Europe's rules adjudicated by the ECJ for the sector where we have a huge deficit with the EU, but remain shut out of the service sector where we have a massive surplus. This so-called soft Brexit will leave us half in and half out with no great increase in flexibility and without a say, a curious way of taking back control. It is, of course, preferable to a hard Brexit, but does it genuinely honor the Brexit mandate? This disagreement is fundamental. It's why the cabinet have not yet reached a negotiating position. Up to now, the negotiation with Europe has been conducted by civil servants in a state of despair, overseen by politicians in a state of denial. <laughs> we cannot go on like this. I've never been more worried about the future of our country than now with competing emotions, frankly, of anxiety and rage. We have a government whose every move is a calculation not about the interests of the nation, but the internal balance of advantage between the factions of the Conservative Party with the Prime Minister more a hostage than a leader. And meanwhile, the leader of the Labour Party neglects to lead the fight here at home over an issue which literally determines the future of Britain and where he could play a decisive role. Parliament, therefore, must assert itself because neither government nor opposition can or will. Then the people must make the final decision because only they have the right to decide what version of Brexit they want or whether in the light of all they now know, they prefer to remain. But the present impasse is imperiling our economy, our international standing, and our alliances. Crashing out with no agreement would deal Britain a devastating blow. Therefore, we should plan now for the possibility we need to extend the March 2019 deadline. Presently, 
we are drifting towards March 2019 with no clear negotiating position, no resolution of the Northern Ireland question, still vaguely hoping that Europe will allow us access to the single market without abiding by its rules, which it will never do, and with senior cabinet members openly debating the merits of a negotiating position, which threatens Europe with a no-deal Brexit, which is the equivalent of holding a negotiation on the top floor of a high-rise building and threatening to jump out of the window if our demands are not met. The whole thing has become so protracted, it has numbed our outrage. And because of the distractive impact of Brexit, the challenges facing the country from the violence in our streets to the decline of the NHS receive not a fraction of the attention they need. But the risk for our allies is also grave. A weaker Britain means a weaker Europe, which means a weaker alliance with America, and therefore a world in which the cause of Western democracy itself is weakened. Brexit has become a metaphor for the debate around globalization. The only way out of the cul-de-sac of populism is to understand that the case for globalization will not succeed unless we deal with the underlying grievances of that part of the population for whom globalization holds more fear than hope. But it's possible to do this. Europe and Britain could strike a bargain which would see Europe reforming, which the European, European people plainly, by their votes, are demanding, and Britain staying in such a Europe. For Europe as well as Britain, this means dealing with the immigration issue decisively. And for all nations, it will require more active government intervention, helping people and communities left behind. Those in the center ground of politics, center right or center left, must become again the change makers, not the managers of the status quo. This challenge, however, is urgent. We are losing sight of the values which brought the West together, sought through the menace of fascism and communism, and for all the justifiable grievances, has wrought immense progress. We're in danger of spoiling the gains of a world opening up through globalization and putting at risk our democratic mission. This is a fight back which will require self-criticism, new thinking, and a certain muscularity in defense of reason. But in my view, the fight back better begin soon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for giving us that lecture. I think it was a two-half lecture is the way I'm going to interpret it. Um, not least as you brought uh, the challenges of globalization and Brexit firmly together in the second half. And I have no doubt we will get uh, a number of questions um, on the Brexit element probably as well uh, as on the broader issue of globalization. But um, to stick to the theme for a minute, if I may, just one follow-up question, if I, if I may. Uh, uh, Mr. Blair, um, you are now obviously the executive chairman of the Tony Blair uh, Institute for Global Change. Mission uh, making globalization work for the many, not for the few. And uh, you've got a number of areas that you're working in. Now, I heard you say one thing in particular that I wanted to, to ask you about. Globalization is not laissez-faire. Um, and you gave as an example the fact that the, uh, under your tenure, the Labour government was able to both be involved in globalization and invest massively in public services. Um, the uh, minimum wage was introduced. I mean, there were a number of steps that were taking, as you said, square the circle. But um, 2007 was the moment where, of course, everything that had been done before turned out to look as if it wasn't sustainable. So the financial crisis came in. One interpretation would be that during that period, Britain was, in fact, living beyond its means, that it was uh, firing on fumes, that in a way it was participating in globalization, but those investments that had been made uh, in the end were not sustainable. And whether it was the chill winds from uh, the global financial crisis as started in the US, but we weren't in a particular strong way to do it. So my question to you, how do we in the West, United States, Europe, 
um, both engage in globalization, but make sure we can afford the quality of life, the public services, the welfare state even, that our societies are so determined about. Because I think people sense those two things actually don't hang together, that 97, 2007, was a mirage almost. Um, not your premiership, but obviously <laughs> the, that, that moment, you know, that in a way it, it, it contains seeds of today. And it, is that a fair point to make or not? Look, I think one of the things I, I found since leaving office is that if, if you don't go out and define your own period in government, people define it for <laughs> <Sorry>. you. <laughs> so, um, just to point out that there was certainly an argument you could have had, and actually we did have it inside the government around 2005, that we should probably have fiscally tightened rather than kept, kept expansion. But that is, was honestly at the margins. The fact is we got hit by the global financial crisis like everyone else. Now, in the end, and actually, as I say, the borrowing in, in, in my 10 years of office was actually lower than the, the previous Conservative government. But in the end... Once the financial crisis hit, you have to take the measures out of that. And I agree some of what we're dealing with is still related to that because until you return to high levels of growth, you don't get the employment and the jobs and so on. But, but we but, were the global financial crisis. We weren't hit by it. I mean, uh, our banks were as vulnerable as any others. Yeah, A lot could, of the deals were done from London. Right, but you could say the Americans, the Europeans were as well. I mean, exactly. every, every government. All of us. No, I meant right. all of us. No, no, absolutely. And so you, my point is very simple. You, you adjust from that. You change the regulatory system in the yep. way that you need to. But what we've got to ask ourselves today, because if you look at the levels of unemployment, for example, which in historic terms would have been the key to, to saying how does the public feel, then what we see today is actually unemployment is, has not risen indeed over Europe recently, it's been falling, and yet this populism has been on the rise. Now, I think that is attributable to two things which we need to focus on and deal with. One is economic malaise in the sense that for some people, not all people, there's been stagnant incomes. Cutbacks in public spending have also um, harmed their general living standards. And, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a feeling that life is changing very fast, especially with the new technological revolution and our people equipped to deal with it. So economics is one part of it. But my own view is that the cultural aspect of this mm. is as big as the economic. And I think there's a, there's a real risk, particularly from my side of politics, the progressive side, that we kind of feel more comfortable talking about the economic and not yeah. comfortable talking about the cultural. Because, you know, if you take a country like Poland, for example, it's quite interesting. This populism has grown in Poland over the last few years as their economy and real wages have been growing strongly. Right. Mm. So I think you've got to, you've got to look at this at, in, in two ways. And essentially what I am saying is that globalization is not the problem. You are always going to have to manage globalization. And there will be periodic crises of a, of a financial or economic sort that will happen. What you've got to do if you want to keep support for the basic processes of globalization that have yielded so much mm. is you have to deal with the economic and the cultural questions. And that's why you know, um, these issues of immigration are really important and can't be ignored. Just one follow-up just to take on keeping the globalization theme. You talked quite a bit about China in the, in the opening half of your remark. I mean, China s seems to be a country that, that at the moment has the perfect blend of sovereignty and openness to globalization. And the bit that they're leaving out is the democracy bit in the middle. And this is where uh, Danny Roderick and others have commented that it's almost an impossible triangle. Sovereignty, democracy, and globalization. Because the tough decisions are really difficult to take. And yet people want sovereignty, they want to be part of globalization. If you're in China, in a way, you're able to make some, some tougher calls. I mean, do you think it really is we're just structurally going to find it very difficult to get through this period? Well, I think it's a really interesting point. And I, 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 I spoke in a conference on democracy in Copenhagen last week where I said, you know, we've got to understand what the challenge to democracy is today. For the first time since the Soviet Union in the 1950s said, you know, actually, we, 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 we're more efficient than you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may be less free. Again, okay, you're going to have a debate about that. But we're delivering for our people in a way you're not. So for the first time in a long time today, you've got what I would call that sort of strongman concept of, of government is issuing a challenge of efficacy yeah. to democracy. Okay. You may be free, but you're actually useless. <laughs> you can't deliver for people. Yeah. And I think the paradox here for the public is that 
at one level, I think the traditional politicians, particularly with social media today, are just kind of, they look as if they're constantly buffeted mm. rather than driving forward and taking decisions. And therefore, what I think the th reason why people feel inclined towards what you might call a kind of Putinist model of government mm. is because they think, yeah, okay, but at least the, 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 someone in charge and mm. they make the thing move and so on. However, there's absolutely no reason why you can't do that in a democratic system. And I think, to be fair to Macron, he's showing that mm. at this present time. And secondly, the trouble with, with dictatorships is that however benign they start off, <laughs> yeah. when they come, become malign, there's not much you can do about it. Yeah. And over a long stretch of time, I think democracy's proved its worth. But the fact we're having this debate, by the way, shows you the scale of the challenge. And I think in respect of China, the critical thing is to realize, you know, when I look ahead to my, now I've got uh, grandchildren, look ahead to what they're going to be experiencing, you know, when they're in their 30s. You know, by 2050, by the middle of this century, you're effectively going to have three giants, America, China, India, right? because their populations are much, much bigger than other uh, countries, certainly China and India, and America's so powerful for all the reasons of resource and position that we know. And then you're going to have some tall countries who will be your kind of Indonesias and your mm. Mexicos and maybe your Russians if they sort themselves out. And then you're going to have medium-sized countries, and those are going to be people like us, Germany, France, right? populations around about 60, 70 million. Okay. There is no way the medium-sized in a land of giants and tall people can secure their interests other than by banding together. Otherwise, the giants are going to sit on them because that's what giants do. <laughs> and the reason for Europe, the reason why I, always, I keep saying to people, it doesn't matter what all the problems of Europe are, there is an underlying force mm -hmm. which will keep this European project together, which is to do with China. Yeah. Because the, the reality, this is what's so crazy when you hear these Brexit people say, we're going to often do these free trade deals with China and India and America. You know, we're sitting across the table with China in the years to come. It, it's, there's no, it's not disrespectful to our country mm. just to kind of recognize you're in a new geopolitics. Unless you have force behind you, you can't make your influence count. And, and that's why it's so, in, in the, the actual geopolitical impact of Britain's decision is, is so damaging and why, you know, I still, I may be the only person in the country who believes this, but I still believe it can and should be stopped. Right. We got back. That was like your speech. We, so there we ended up with yeah, Brexit. No, sorry. It's good. Yeah, no, but I, I, I think there'll be a lot of interest. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a lot of interest. Let, my apologies. Let, let, me, let me get a few questions in. I'll take uh, sort of two or three in a group and, I, I'm group, and I will see them as I have. Hands go up. First hand went up at the back, I think, almost appropriately, um, from a former minister, I think, actually. So, Dennis, you're right at the back. I'll come to the front, and I'm going to take, yeah, James. <coughs> Uh, Robin, pr Prime Minister as was. Uh, thank you. I think you held the room. You won probably the argument, but we've lost the people. How do we bring them back? That's a nice direct question. And yeah. I'll, I'll take three and we'll... Um, uh, do you want to hold that one for a second? Do you yeah, want to, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll, just, I'll just take three. Yeah, right at the front, please, here. Microphone right at the very, 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 very front. Now I'll take James. Um... So there seems to be a, a sort of a two-tiered uh, configuration of governance today. You have what globalization and what we need through globalization, but it's not exactly meeting the needs locally in communities and cities. There seems to be a disconnect there. Uh, what are your thoughts on greater devolved powers uh, in countries generally? And also on the migration which uh, issue in, in Europe, I think will be the disentanglement of Europe if we don't handle it based on more than just to organize hypocrisy. What are your thoughts when you say it has to be managed? What do you mean by that? Okay, and James, one more there, then I'll, I'll get, to, we have plenty of time. Yes, just there, yeah. Um, two very quick questions. Uh, some people argue, Mr. Blair, that the way to save the international rules-based order is to reform it so that it better reflects the current balance of power, that it takes into account China and India. Um, what do you make of that? Is it possible for that reform to be made without making compromises on the values that you think that rules-based order currently espouses? Uh, 
and, and secondly, if you were given the essay title, Global Britain, mm. how would you answer it? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let that was those three questions ended up being about five, I think. So um, we'll try, and I'll try and be more disciplined after this, but they're all good questions. So yeah. I'll let you take them all you want, and I've got a track as well. <clears throat> we get the people back um, by dealing with the underlying grievances through policies that actually work, um, and then remaking the case for why an open approach is still the best approach, and why, you know, if you, if you go to protectionism, isolationism, nativism, it doesn't, it doesn't work for people. I mean, look, uh, Dennis, as you, you and I remember, I mean, we, we, won, we did win three elections in a row, and we governed for longer than the, twice as long as the previous Labour governments. And one of the reasons we did that was because I was always very conscious of the fact we had to keep our traditional base with us. And that traditional base was often dealing with multiple problems around education, healthcare, and things like law and order. And you will remember when I, you know, one of the ways I sort of, as it were, made my mark in the Labour Party was to say the Labour Party had become a party that took the issues of law and order really seriously. And then towards the end of my time, when I could see this immigration thing building, we then put forward a solution on the immigration question, which is around identity cards, which was extremely unpopular at the time and everyone complained about it. But as I said, if you want to deal with it, you're going to have to deal with, take tough measures to do it. So I think we, we gain the people. We, I'm not sure, you know, this is why I, I always find it, I mean, I shouldn't, but I always find it a trifle sort of disturbing when the people that have lost elections, you know, blame their defeat on those of us that won them. Um, but, the, you know, I think if, if I was to look self-critically at, at, at this point, I would say for sure if I was back in government today, I would be trying to deal with the issues that I could see were, were moving people today. And even on the issue of Europe, you know, freedom of movement within Europe, where we did miscalculate the numbers of people that came, although I think overall this has been of enormous benefit for the country, once I saw there were huge problems arising, I would have been dealing with it, I can assure you. And I think the other thing is, we haven't lost all the people. You know, I think it was 52-48. It wasn't like 70-30. You know, if you look at the Clinton-Trump vote in the US, I mean, I'm just, there's a lot to play for. Hmm. And, you know, I, it's too early in the Macron presidency to see, but it seems to me that what that shows you is it isn't impossible from what I would call a rational center ground position to win support. I just think we need to be smart about it. What we can't do, and that comes to the second question, is around issues like immigration. You, you, you can't dispute that people are worried about them. And by the way, if you look at, you know, I became aware of this when I was actually on holiday in, in Sicily a few years back, I mean, it's about three years ago, and I went into one of the local towns and I saw the local mayor and then I came back out and, you know, because I, uh, for various reasons, for quite high profile in Italy. Anyway, it was like a group of people kind of assembled who were saying to me, what are you going to do about this immigration? I mean, I, I'm not even a British prime minister anymore. Not my, but anyway, so you, know, you ended up having a kind of you know, constituency town meeting, town hall meeting with a whole lot of people who, but they were really angry. And they were angry because they felt there were a whole lot of people who didn't necessarily share their values. And they just thought they had no control over this. Now, these are not unreasonable people. Yeah. You know, so one of the things you've got to, the way of dealing with this immigration thing is to realize that today you would get massive support for Europe controlling its borders much more effectively, which it could do, not leaving the southern states to deal with this thing mm -hmm. on their own because they're not capable of dealing with it. And why should they? Because it's a European problem. Having much better relations with those countries from which you know, the migration is coming and actually securing um, agreements for the return of people who are, uh, are, are not asylum seekers but economic migrants that the country doesn't want to take in. 
I think you will get to a situation, not just in, I think this is right for Britain, but across Europe, where you have to have some form of proof that you're entitled to be in the country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of these things are contrary to human rights or mm -hmm. the values of Western democracy. On the contrary, I think they're the way of preserving them. Mm -hmm. But if you're not prepared to show you, you're going to deal with this immigration question, you're just going to be left in a situation where if you don't deal with it, someone's going to exploit it. Mm. And, and that's really the lesson of the politics of the last few years. Devolution, I fully support, but I, I, honestly, I'm not sure it's going to be an answer to mm. uh, the, this problem. Um, Rules-based international order. Yeah. Can we reform it? Yeah, you, the Chinese and the Indians, the Japanese, they, they've got a case. So how you do it is very, very difficult. I remember trying and being involved in discussions to reform the UN Security Council. And I mean, that is the political equivalent of the Rubik Cube. So um, <laughs> it's very difficult to do it, but I think we should try to do it. And there's absolutely no reason why we have to diminish our values in order to do that. But if you're China and you're looking at your power and footprint in the world, you'd think, well, why shouldn't I be of equal status with with, with the other big powers. I think it's perfectly reasonable. Would, would you, in, I'm thinking of an article that our incoming chairman, uh, Jim O'Neill, uh, put out about a week ago, and you said, look, on the G7, if it is going to be the club of democracies that are big economies, why is it those ones? Why not have Brazil or India or Spain uh, yeah. in there? Would you, would you sort of pull apart, if you were prime minister right now, look at something like the G7 and say, well, that, that was good at one point, but it, it needs redesigning. Would, would you be that radical? Yes, I would. And I, I also think one of the reasons why the G20 has assumed importance is precisely because people think the G7 is too limited, and it is. I mean, it's just totally, you know, um, American, Europe-based. So I think, no, I think we should do that. What, global Britain? Well, if, if I wanted to advocate for global Britain, I wouldn't start by getting out of the main alliance on our doorstep. I think that would be my basic... I don't know whether I get a... It depends who's marking the paper if I said that. <laughs> but, I mean, it drives me mad when these people talk about this. It's so ridiculous. I mean, if Britain wants to be a global player today, it's got to leverage its alliances. One of those is with America. The other is obviously with the commercial market and political union on its doorstep. And, you know, it's... And the other thing that I find... Is this is one of the things that's really troubling about this whole Brexit business, is that I really do think that for the people really driving Brexit, this has never been just about getting out of Europe. It's a two-step thing. You get out of Europe so you can take it, us down this you know, ultra-free market path. But what I keep saying to people is, where's the evidence that the British people are going to vote for this? And the risk is you do the first step and you never do the second. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, I read an article by, uh, um, I think it was the former policy director or chief in Theresa May's office. But it was all about, you know, we're going to do Brexit and then here are all these things we want to do for Britain, which are basically about fairer capitalism, more spending on the NHS and so on. So question number one, why do you need to leave Europe to do any of that? Question number two, I mean, how utterly bonkers is it to leave Europe and then start importing the European social model into Britain? <laughs> I mean, I understand that intellectually the argument you leave Britain because you hate the social model, which I don't, but to leave it and then start putting workers on the boards and whatnot, I mean... Right. <laughs> I think what you're saying is you, you wouldn't start from here, is what yeah, I'm... No, 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 no. Yes, <laughs> uh, right, the gentleman here had his hand up Irish very heritage. kindly. I'm going to take a couple from the front. Uh, yes, you... I'll do a little threesome over there, but I'll start from there. I will get you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, a re really uh, encouraging and optimistic uh, lecture from yourself, uh, Tony. I'd like to ask, uh, uh, in that vein, about building political consensus alliance with people who I think from different parties would agree with you. For example, Nick Clegg, David Cameron, even Theresa May voted to remain, and, and John Major. I think if the public heard from many voices from different political parties, do you think that would make a difference? Okay. Um, right, lady at the front, and then gentleman there. Yep, I'll get you. Lady at the front, 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 white jacket. I, 
Uh, two questions. Uh, Mr. Blair, I wondered if you, uh, you've addressed uh, the issue of immigration in, in saying what should be done now. I wonder if you bear any sense of personal responsibility for your government's failure to um, implement the measures that were at your disposal uh, at the time when freedom of movement began. Um, yeah. Uh, Henry Mance from, from the Financial Times. Are you satisfied with the way that President Trump's visit to the UK is being handled, and how do you think we should judge its success? And we'll see how that plays out in a minute. Okay, um, and I'm going to get one ambassadorial question to start with here. Yep, and then we'll, we'll stop. We'll take that group. Yep, thank and you. And then I'll come back here. Yep. My, my name is Yuri Pires, High Commissioner of Cyprus. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Insightful, clear text. Two questions. How do you answer the, uh, the statistics uh, coming from World Economic Forum and others that 1% of the world's population basically is controlling more than 85% of the world's wealth. Therefore, globalization hasn't been fair to all, and, and the rich become richer, the poor become poorer, and all that that goes down the line. Do you see a, also a security aspect in globalization? Obviously, the Chinese come in, they don't ask any questions, they invest, we need investments. You wake up one morning and your country isn't there whether these are the Chinese or the Indians or whoever else of the, of the big guys that you talk. And I represent a micro state, therefore I don't, I don't know how I fit in this whole <laughs> global thing. Thank you. We got a little cluster there, building political consensus for the first and then. Well, my yeah. daughter-in-law is a Greek Cypriot, so you fit in very much oh. into the Blair uh, family. Uh, <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> Yes, got you. Okay. You're a little rusty. <laughs> right. Um, so, on the build, building of the political consensus, yeah, no, I think we should. I think there should be far more. I mean, on, on, on the whole question to do with how, how you, you know, basically how you approach what I would call the open minded view of the world, of which Brexit is a part of that whole debate, yeah, and, and I'm very happy to work with people in different political parties to do it. Uh, one of the ways, by the way, I think we also build support for, um, you know, the the, the process of, of, of globalization is also to show that your, you know, one of the, the, the dangers of present politics is that it becomes very fractured. I mean, if you look at the situation both in the U.S. and here, if you're not careful, you're going to end up with a fragmented electorate, you know, two groups of people who aren't really talking with each other, aren't listening with each other, and actually aren't liking each other. I think that's dangerous for democracy long term. And so the more that there can be some sense that people are prepared to reach across the political divide, I think the better, and I personally would su support it. You know, the personal responsibility in immigration, so there are two different things here. One is non-EU immigration, and the other is uh, freedom movement within the EU. It's very important, um, which I was trying to explain to Mr. Humphreys on the Today programme when I could get a word in this morning. <laughs> it, it, so the, the uh, transitional arrangements when the Eastern Europeans joined the EU in 2004, we could have put them in. It's important to realise they wouldn't have affected freedom of movement. Freedom of movement came in for all of those countries when they joined the European Union. What we could have had transitional arrangements in respect of are the right to work. Right. The worry that we had at the time, first of all, obviously the economy was roaring ahead strongly, we actually needed people to come in, but the worry at the time was that people would come in because they were entitled to come in through freedom of movement and then would work without agreement. And actually Germany had very similar problems even though they put in transitional arrangements. But the other point to make is this, which I think is, is really important about enlargement. One of the frustrations the Europeans have with our present position is that the two things that British governments used to fight for in Europe and became frankly a pain in the collective backside of Europe over were support for the single market and support for enlargement. And single market, the single market was actually created under the Thatcher government. It was continued by John Major, developed by, by myself, and it was a great British national interest. So you can imagine the irritation of the Europeans now to be told that we want out of that because it doesn't suit us. And then to say, and what we really don't like about Europe is the freedom of movement that's brought people in from Eastern Europe when enlargement was again a major priority of the British government. And it's important to restate why we did this. 
Think today of the security situation in Eastern Europe if we hadn't brought those countries mm -hmm. into the European mm -hmm. Union. And just to give you one interesting statistic, where people think, because this is why we make payments into the EU today, is essentially for structural payments in those poorer European countries that are now becoming wealthier. In 2004, our trade with Poland was roughly three and a half billion pounds. Today, it's 13 and a half billion. So it's not that we've lost financially in the end, even over this. And this is why it's important to take a broad view of it. So on non-EU immigration, you know, again, as I tried to point out this morning, we were taking measures again and again and again on asylum, immigration, and so on. And we have, we're not part of Schengen in Europe. It's again one of the bizarre things about Britain. We've got an opt-out of the Euro and Schengen. We actually do have the best of both worlds in Europe at the moment. Mm. So, you know, we're entitled to restrict our immigration as we wish. The reason we haven't is because we haven't chosen to. And by the way, the reasons for not bearing down on immigration too much and encouraging at least managed migration is because it does an enormous benefit for our economy. Mm. And, you know, there's no modern economy today that is going to be successful unless it's encouraging migrants of talent and ability to come to our country. And, you know, why do you think the Japanese, after years and years and years of saying they don't want immigration, are now desperately trying to encourage it? It's for that reason. So, um, and Trump, Trump. Well, is it being handled? Yeah, I mean, look, it's being handled as it can be handled. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I think, I mean, first of all, I completely, whatever disagreements Britain might have with the present American administration, it's completely sensible that we have the American president here. You, you know, this is, look, for heaven's sake, what we can't do is do Brexit and then refuse to meet the American president. That would be, <laughs> you know, I mean, come on, I mean, this is, these guys. It's, so we should definitely, of course we should have them here, and I think the most important thing is that the visit, the most sensible thing, and I think what he will want as well, is to focus it on issues. Uh, because even though there are some areas of disagreement, there are plenty of things where Britain and America cooperate very strongly, particularly in security, uh, and where we need to work closely together. And, you know, I think that's why I've, I've always supported Theresa May in, in inviting him here, and I think that there's no person who's ever been Prime Minister who would ever think it's sensible not to, <laughs> not to invite the President of America to, to visit us. Uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, if you were sitting in a um, European summit meeting today, debating how to respond to President Trump's imposition of tariffs, would you be among the group saying, look, we've got to match them tit for tat. This is kind of bully situation. And if we don't, we've got to negotiate from a position of strength. Or would you be saying, folks, we've got to bite our tongues. And don't escalate. Because if we let this go further, actually the transatlantic alliance, which as you said, has been so important for this country, is really going to be under threat. Uh, President Trump is looking for a to take on the EU. It's the ideal enemy in a way, weaker and doesn't fit in some of his values. But, but would you be arguing match the sanctions, uh, match the tariffs, or would you be arguing for control? You, you, you can't let tariffs be slapped on and just sit there passively. Okay. Um, I think what I would be trying to do is to pull the American administration at every different level into a dialogue about what they really want. Because as I say, you know, there are bits of what the administration uh, it's very Trump, but it's because you know people feel so strongly about it but there are bits of what the US is saying for example about China's position which are perfectly justifiable points to make the question is how you deal with them and I think what I would be trying to do in relation to Europe is say look if there are big worries that America has in respect of Europe and its own barriers to trade, let's sit down and talk them through. Mm -hmm. um, but if people act unilaterally, you, they've got to know that they can't, you know, you're not just passively going to accept yeah. that. I think this is one of the, this is an area where, you know, as in so many things, and I think this is, this is why what, what, what often happens to people when whatever skepticism about Europe they had before they go into government, most people when they get into government mm -hmm. and you start dealing with the reality, you realize whether it's trade or it's Iran or it's the Middle East or it's you know, any of the big security issues of the day or it's how you deal with Russia or what do we do about you know, the rise of China, you realize that in the end, Britain A needs to be with 
other European nations in dealing with this. Um, and it also has a unique role to play because it, 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 and certainly up until very recently, we did play that role. You know, I would spend a lot of my time as prime minister and I, I think the same was true of Gordon Brown and David Cameron and, and, and John Major. We spend a lot of our time, you know, navigating between mm -hmm. and trying to bring the two sides together. And I think it's an important role for Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you can't you, you can't really do that if you you know if you, if you if you leave Europe. And then the last two is on the, the one percent control, the eighty five percent, and whether there's a security dimension as well to foreign investment. Yeah, no, I think there is a. Um, you, you, you've got to be, well, put it like this. I think we would do a lot better attracting investment if the West was far less bureaucratic about it and more nimble, because a lot of the reasons why, I mean, I do an immense amount of work in Africa and we have many different projects, for example, in Africa, where what you find is the reason why people turn to investment from China is, is that they don't get snared in the bureaucracy of the West, which means that projects don't get done and fulfilled. But I think we can do it in a way that's compatible with our values. And on the 1%, I think this is a very valid point. But one of the things my institute is doing at the moment, and we'll publish some work in probably a, a couple of months' time, is I think we really need to dig deep down under what's really happening to income levels. Because it's not true that in all countries inequality has risen. It is true that there is a, a, a very small number at the top who've done super well compared with everyone else. But when you start to analyze the figures, and I say we'll have much better data on this in the, in the time to come, but when you you start to, to analyze it, you see two other things that are really interesting. First of all, there's 30 and 40% that have actually done reasonably well and feel reasonably at home in the new economy, but there's a large part of the population that don't, but it's not quite the same as saying there's 1% and then 99, or even 10% and then 90. But secondly, there's about 10% that are cut adrift. Yeah. And the rising tide's not gonna lift their boat at all. So I think you've got, you know, I think on this issue, this is a big question, but you've got to dig deep down beneath it. And the other thing I think that is really, really important is to realize that I think part of the alienation is cultural and it's not economic. Right, we, we're, we've literally, we're on our knife edge here. There's two people I absolutely promised I would let bring in and there was at least one hand I saw there. So the two people with their hands up there on the corner and then there was, yes, that lady right there and yeah. Exactly. I might just come here in the front as well. Go ahead, please. Uh, Dave, David Hughes from the Press Association. Uh, you've suggested that the March 2019 deadline for Brexit may have to slip. You've also suggested that the European Union could implement reforms which may allow the UK to uh, remain within it. Uh, presumably they couldn't be done by March 2019, so is that another reason why an extension may be helpful to the UK remain a cause? Okay, and Mike right behind you. Yep. Hi, Alex McDonald from uh, Middle East Eye. Um, one of the issues you've spoken about before as uh, a major threat to the global order, of course, is uh, international radical Islamism. Um, in uh, April 2014, you said the West should ally with Putin's Russia to tackle the issue of uh, radical Islam. I was wondering if you still think that. Okay, and lady, please help me out. Uh, do you think the uh, forthcoming election for the European presidency is an opportunity? And do you share my view that Jean-Claude Juncker was a malign influence on <laughs> European <laughs> politics and reform? On the record question, I think I will just take this last one. If you could bring the microphone to the front. <laughs> you got the microphone in the front. Can you just put it right here? Because this gentleman did have his hand up, sorry, earlier. And in case you don't answer the previous one, I'll, I'll let you. Uh, Thank you very one. much, because it's related to the previous oh, really? one. At the end of your presentation, Mr. Blair, you said that Brexit can and should be stopped. And you also talked about the UK and the EU agreeing to reform. So in the context of, of, of reversing that decision, what would you think should be the message from Europe to the UK and to those wavering voters That's, coming forward? That would forward? be a nice one to finish on. We are over time, so yep, I'll let you be quickly. very disciplined on these. Um, so let me deal with the, the, the middle two. I mean, the election for the European presidency, yes, it's a real opportunity to make sure that someone is elected who is, uh, let's say, you know, fully politically sensitive to the anxieties in Europe. <laughs> um, I won't comment any further on that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, you are diplomatic. This yeah, is I, well, I'm at Chatham House, so I feel I should do a certain amount. <laughs> On, on the Middle East, yeah, on, on, on fighting terrorism, yes. I mean, we, we, we will have to ally with Russia. But that's not to say that we don't, we aren't prepared to have very powerful and strong disagreements with them where they're doing things we, we don't agree with and can't agree with. Um, but, you know, this is, this is why we'll always, with Russia, we'll be having disagreements, which can be very ugly and difficult from time to time, but we'll always also be wanting to deal with them at a certain point, which is why we need to be careful how we approach the relationship. Um, on um, these first and last questions yeah. kind of go together in a way. Okay. Look, my view is this. What you can't have is a situation in which Britain goes out of Europe at the end of March 2019 and doesn't know what it's getting. I think the government wants to do that, I'm afraid, because I think they have no answer to the central dilemma of negotiation. Because it's obvious, as you can see from the cabinet, um, they don't seem to be bound by cabinet or Chatham House rules of any sort <laughs> at all. They have a profound disagreement. One lot wants to keep close to Europe, but that will mean regulatory alignment, and that will mean the debate is, what's the point? And the other one wants to go for a clean break Brexit, in which case business and those warnings from Airbus and the others are going to be very real, in which case, what's, what's the price? That division is not resolved. They haven't begun negotiating. When you talk to the Europeans and you say, well, how's the negotiation going? They kind of say, well, other than on process, there isn't one. So you can't afford for the country to pull out. If, and by the way, a meaningful vote should mean a meaningful vote in the sense that we know what this new relationship is and the government has made its choice before you go out of the European Union. But to go out of Europe without knowing what the future is, that is a catastrophe for the country because you're going to be out of Europe, you'll have no bargaining power with the rest of Europe, and these Brexit guys can then take us in whatever direction they want and will have no power to retrieve the situation at all. So I think that is extremely important. However, it would be a lot easier, but I'm only saying you need to extend the time if you get to the end of March 2019, they've still not resolved it. Yeah. And finally, Europe, look, the sensible thing, I mean, maybe this is too rational a view in today's world. The sensible thing is for Europe to realize that represented a feeling that is not specifically or exclusively British. That's what all these elections have shown you over the last few months. This is a European-wide feeling. It's just that Britain had the referendum. Mm -hmm. So the sensible thing is for Europe to reconsider and rethink its positions and come to a view about reform and change in Europe, particularly over these issues to do with migration, and for Britain to be made an offer that allows us to stay with dignity. And that is, in a rational world, that's what we would do. Because if we leave, look, look what, what do we know in the last two years? It's not, the most these people now say about Brexit is it's not as bad as you guys say. <laughs> uh, so it's, there's, there's, there's no, you go out around the world, there's nobody saying, ah, oh, that's a really wise thing you guys have done. <laughs> Nobody's saying that. Okay. And, but for Europe, I think they are also, after a period where there was a certain amount of kind of schadenfreude about the whole thing because people got so fed up with it, I think they also realize it's going to be a weaker Europe. Mm -hmm. So the, the statesmanship is about taking those situations which seem irresolvable and managing somehow to knit together a resolution. And that's what we should focus on. Mr. Bill, I think John Whitehead would have loved to be sitting in the front row uh, of this conversation because you weave together both um, uh, the politics of today but also with some great structural insights about the politics of the world. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. I think we'll see whether Britain can remain very much part of Europe if Brexit does happen in the ways that, that, uh, that it, it appears likely to happen. Um, and certainly we'll see if the UK can remain part of the US beyond President Trump as well and be part of that very close relationship. If not, I think what we've taken away from you, globalization is going to be that much harder to handle, very difficult to handle indeed. But together we have a much, much better chance of doing so. Could I ask you please to try and remain in your seats if you could for a second while I'm able to escort uh, Mr. Blair out uh, on the side there. But please, a very strong hand for Tony Blair. Thank you very much. <laughs>